for that great introduction. Um, I didn't know how I was going to follow two uh, PhD holders and uh, pr a professor at Kellogg. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, thank you very much, and thank you for Raj uh, for the invite and uh, uh, the, the the great hosting uh, facility here. So. Really appreciate that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really, as, as you mentioned, going to really look at, you know, how we're managing innovation. And really, you know, I was asked to uh, um, present today, and any time I get asked to present, I really want to try to make it something that I can deliver something of value to you. So I'm going to try to do that in a number of ways. Um, a few, few things I want to mention. Um, somebody asked the question in the previous session around, you know, how does this work in a B2B versus B2C? Well, we really live that um, extensively because our, our world is we were this joint venture. We were created to do online sales, uh, direct online sales to consumers uh, through e-commerce. And we launched that in 2000, and consumers weren't really ready to buy a car online. They were still, uh, you know, just getting over the tipping point of buying CDs at that time. I mean, that's how, you know. Long ago, so we kind of shifted and had to pivot, and our companies had to pivot a lot. But we really have been a digital solution provider for for the last uh, um, 15, 16 years now, and we're constantly looking at how we uh, drive uh, better experience for the retail uh, customer um, by providing great digital solutions for Ford and the dealers. But really have to think about that entire value chain, and so I'll talk a little bit more about that and how we how we operationalize our activities around the innovation. Um, and really, uh, you know, there's been a huge push inside of, of Ford Motor Company to drive innovation through every, every, every area of our business. And it's a difficult challenge because, you know, Ford Motor Company is a, almost a 110-year-old company. Um, we've got this, you know, very old, I mean, uh, Professor uh, Sani talked about, you know, the experiences that suck. There's no experience that sucks worse than going to buy a car, going to get your car serviced. So I'm, I'm trying to change that. We're trying to change that. And so hopefully you'll see, I'm going to share a couple of examples of work that we're doing today that is, um, that is new and different. And hopefully you'll see that, you know, hopefully some bleeding edge examples of things that are happening uh, that will change and make that experience better for, for all of you and all of our customers. Um, so he, he did a good job kind of summarizing. Yeah, this is my old high school picture. Not really. I just uh, like to throw in a little bit of humor from time to time. Um, and uh, nothing really here to say other than my, my roots are really, I, I went to, initially was going to school for mechanical engineering and then had an opportunity to do a startup. And in 1993, started r developing websites and, and really got interested in the you know, internet age and was just kind of, you know, jumped in full force. and. I've been building web applications and uh, connected solutions ever since then. So, um, but started as a technologist, development to my root at, at my root. So, um, going to take you through, give you a glimpse of the future, talk about fut some of the threats that are facing our, our business, talk about some of those game-changing uh, uh, experiences that we're bringing to life, and then really trying to bring that back to what does that mean to you, and and, and how are we managing that, and how maybe there's some useful things there that you could take and apply to your own business. So, you know, glimp in, glimpse into the future. So these are all things that are actively occurring. I, I love this picture back here because um, this is, um, I think it was a GM that published this in, in Life Magazine, 1956, and it's autonomous driving. So you see there's no one driving the car. And the thing I love about this is not only is no one driving the car, but they said, oh, you can, people aren't gonna sit and face forward, that's smart, but they're still gonna play uh, Scrabble or Bingle, on, you know, so that I found really fascinating. So very forward-looking, um, but some of these things that have been being worked on for a number of years are really reaching their tipping point. Um, McDonald's here is, uh, you know, self-serve um, kiosk that will allow you to kind of place your order on your own. They've actually been doing this now for a decade and trying to get this right. But they found some really interesting things that a customer who does the work on their own and purchases through the kiosk. Will on average uh, buy 30, to, or their, the revenue for that bill will be 30 to 40 percent more than if uh, having to order it on their own, and 20 percent more of people will uh, take the recommendations from the kiosk rather than the recommendations from the cashier behind the counter, which is really interesting because, as you know, you go in there, you ask them, oh, "This is what I want," and they always sit you with, "Well, do you want a coke with that? Do you want it?" And you're like, "No, I don't want that." But if you prompt it in, inside the digital experience, people opt into that. It's very fascinating. Um, far right, um, I have a real passion about robotics and, and a real internal struggle because of 
friend of mine uh, is a doctor, is really pushing me to take all of my technology experience and passion for robotics and better trying to drive a better life for, for people. And, and, and this is an exoskeleton where um, you know, they're providing the ability for um, people who can't walk or paralyzed um, uh, to walk again and uh, do that through the signals of their brain and tapping into that, uh, really awesome. We talked about drones before. Um, uh, augmented reality is a great one. Um, we talked about, um, you know, one of the things I want you to contemplate, and this is coming from a technologist, we're all, we talked a lot about the speed of change that's taking place in technology. Really want you to question that. The speed of change is really happening as fast as cultural change takes place. Professor, uh, I went back and got my MBA, uh, was, was really highlighting this. If you really think about all the changes that have taken place in the last 20, 25 years culturally versus technology, a lot of the same things that we're doing or working on today, we've been working on for 20, 25 years in the technology space. But yet, if I look back at the culture and the way the world has changed over those years, uh, it's really um, changed a lot. And then like augmented reality, virtual reality, I've been working on for, for years and years, and it hadn't really reached a tipping point. But then I always love the example of Pokemon Go, right? Pokemon Go launched and a one billion downloads of that application in a weekend. I mean, people were waking up Monday mo morning, everyone was talking about Pokemon Go, and if you were one of the six billion who hadn't yet downloaded it, you were probably trying to dive in and figure out what's going on there. Bottom left is the, is the humanoid robotic workforce, and I really think that this is an interesting space. We talked about artificial intelligence and a lot of the uh, applications, and, and we'd like to bring them into human form, but really, what type of disruption is that introducing into our, our workforce? And um, the assistant's a really great one. Uh, I have an assistant myself and uh, rely more and more on my artificial assistant than, than my physical assistant. Lawn mowers that uh, mow your lawn on your own, that's the best thing ever. I've got one of those in my house. I've got the Roomba in my house. I mean, those types of things that you no longer have to do are just uh, really helpful. And then really the connected self, really awesome. And now in, integrating all of that connected uh, biometric readings and stuff right into the fabric of the clothes. Um, and, uh, and then really the urbanization, and, or the uh, uberization and um, the, you know, the on-demand workforce is another major change. Well, what's happening in automotive is there's a lot of dif different disruptors out there. Um, upper right is uh, uh, Carvana. So Carvana, you can go online and you can buy a used car from end to end, do everything, find your car, finance it. Um, manage through your trade-in, purchase it, and then uh, deliver it right at your home. Or if you'd like, they have a few locations where you can go and they have um, a vending machine. Literally, you, you give in a code and you walk up to the vending machine, and this is the vending machine here, and you type in your code and down comes your car and you get in your car and drive, drive away, which is really, somebody talked earlier around just the change of what the role of the dealer, think about the role of the dealership and, and how it really needs to be like a celebration, the delivery, they're really not gonna do anything in, in the purchase process anymore. Um, and so it's really a ma matter of, you know, how do you leverage that, those assets? And we'll talk a little bit about how we're doing that uh, in the automotive space. But Uber is another one. They're not only um, a, you know, on-demand transportation service, but they're one of the largest investors in autonomous driving. And uh, now you can go to Pittsburgh uh, as of, I think, last week, and they have a Uber um, automated driving force. Now, they have a, t uh, a controller in the car behind the wheel, but not touching the wheel, and they will take you on drives uh, throughout uh, Pittsburgh and the city. Now, it's kind of random, so you don't know whether you're going to get one or not. I wanted to go there. I was like, how, how hard is it going to be? And I looked up, and you know, there's whatever, I think 1,500 vehicles, but only 10 of them are, are the self-driving cars, so I might be there a while trying to get one. Um, but... Uh, um, some, some really interesting changes taking place. And, and uh, BP is another, another great one. So uh, with BP, you can, you can purchase any car from any location through any, uh, any this is all used cars, uh, and you have it delivered to you at your location of choice for, for free. So they've kind of eliminated the cost of transportation uh, and, and moving a vehicle from one retailer to another. And, and now making all, all used car inventory available online. And we're trying to dr disrupt ourselves. So we talked about the online purchase process. We launched that in 2000. Consumers weren't really ready to buy, but we're seeing now a ton of investment in, in all the automotives trying to bring that uh, experience back, back to, to life. And we've now launched that 
uh, for Lincoln and Ford. Um, and then uh, on dem uh, there's a, a number of co companies who are testing shared uh, ownership models. Um, and, uh, and so we see disruption taking place there. And Lincoln uh, just introduced now pick up, free pickup and delivery for all your service work. So just like Tesla, you don't have to, um, you don't have to uh, bring it into to the dealership. So now, think about all that. I can buy the car online. I can have it delivered to where I want. And uh, my service work, they'll come and take care of it on my own. So you know, who needs dealers anymore? Who needs, you know, what, what, what's their role now? We think that the dealers have a huge opportunity and can play a significant role. So they, they do have a ton of assets that are really valuable, right? There's property, uh, huge amounts of property that they own that are in great locations for multimodal mobility solutions. So if, if you need to take and transport yourself into town and take a shuttle and you're out in a rural area, you're going to come in into a hub and they could be great hubs for that. Um, they also have all of that expertise and, and ability to, to service vehicles. So now if you think about utilization of all the vehicles that are on the road, it's one hour out of 24 hours that a car is used. So that's um, totally underutilized, 95% underutilization. All these sh use of uh, shared services are going to provide more utilization of those vehicles, but those vehicles will now have to be serviced more, more often. And every time uh, that vehicle is out of service is going to be uh, more expensive. So an opportunity really for dealers to kind of uh, bring a great uh, servicing solution to, to bear. So, so this is a, a really good one. So if I think about this dilemma, this is a, from the innovators dilemma. Um, but a lot of c companies pay a, lot, pay a lot of attention to what their customers are telling them. And as, as folks said, this is, you should be a c consumer centric company. And when you model out, if, actually, I want to go back to the B2B question before. So if you think about your customer journey mapping instead of your funnel mapping anymore and your functions of the funnel, and you're thinking about the whole customer journey and how, how to support that customer journey, well, you as a B2B supplier should be thinking about your customer and your customer journey and how your customer's journey is supporting its uh, customer's journey. And so when you start to solution and look for new opportunities and new, new, new solutions to bring to your B2B customer, you want to make sure that that's helping fulfill their, their needs. So one of the things that we're working on uh, right now is just our whole dealer journey map and, and the retail journey. We've been doing the retail journey map, retail customers map for, for a number of years now and looking at all of their pain points and un, unmet needs, both spoken and unspoken unmet needs. Um, but we are uh, now doing that for our, for our dealers as well to make sure the solutions we bring to bear are are resolving both of them. But you know, this is hard in the automotive space right now because uh, disrupting yourself is, is, a bit of, is, is a bit of a challenge because uh, the automotives have never been more profitable. Dealers have never been more profitable. This is the best time in the automotive age. But we can all, all see all the changes that are play, taking place, consumers' expectations, customer satisfaction in this experience continues to dwindle. It's only a matter of time. Tesla is working on it. They're bringing scale to their products. They're bringing their price point down. Don't think that they're a, a plan to be just an elite brand for, for the rich. They're, they're really trying to be a solution for, for all. Um, and uh, is anyone here familiar with the diffusion of innovation curve here? Um, one person, a couple people. I love this uh, chart because it's uh, a really good thing to think about when you're thinking about how to manage in innovation and drive innovation within your own organization. Often what happens is like, OK, we want to do something new and different. And if you take something new and different, and I ask everyone their, their opinion about you know, whether it's good or bad, what we end up doing is we kind of start settling on the mediocre. We don't really take a lot of risk, and, and, and companies get stuck in this, in, this, in this lane. And really what this says is there's really only 2.5% of the population are the true innovators, the true you know, um, people who will invent new things and, and change the way we, we, we drive the world. And we all can fit along this curve in different areas of our life, by the way, um, at different times of our life. So, but those 2.5% are really driving those change. And the 13.5% that's referred to as the early adopters right after that, those are the ones who are quick to jump on board, try it. They're willing to try new things. That sounds like it might help. I will give it a go. It doesn't take me much. Just let me give it a shot. And then there's this chasm to get to the next group of what is called the early majority, late majority, and the late mass. By the way, the late mass of the kicking and one, the ones who are, you know, you got to pull kicking and screaming. They're the ones who are still trying to buy a corded phone. Best by the only reason they won't 
won't buy the next one is because they stopped selling it, you know, or they're it's, you know, still using feature phones until they claw them out of their hands. They are really uh, the last, but the chasm is really the important part. And how do I cross this chasm? So I have a good idea. I get the early adopters, and and how do I get to the next uh, um, bulk of population that will really embrace my the, the work I'm doing? And um, it really requires uh, social proof. So I want to give you an example of what that means. So two Apple experiences. I don't know if we have anyone from Apple here um, before I tear them apart. No. Um, so we have <laughs> two two examples. One is the iPhone. So the iPhone. Uh, um, Obviously, it's been a phenomenon. Another example of something that was really nothing new, but just taking a lot of what already existed and building uh, uh, a new solution around it. But it launched, and it took off, and it continued to take off, and it got past that chasm, and, and, and now you know, everyone has, either has had an iPhone or has an iPhone or uh, now has an Android device, which is a replica of that iPhone. But they launched the iWatch, and um, they had a lot of early success. But then, very quickly, they had their sales dropped off and plummeted. And I want to, I want you to think about the two. And I don't know. I saw a few watches, uh, connected watches, and I was an early adopter of that. And then I don't have one anymore because I really couldn't get to the benefits beyond. Oh, it was nice to know when somebody texted or a phone call came in, and I could quickly look. But I really found like that was really bothersome for everybody that I was interfacing with because I work in a lab and I'm constantly interfacing with lots of people and I would get something and it would flag and I would and they were like you got to go you, 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 is my, am I holding you up and I'm like no I just you know taking it rather than pulling it out and checking it all the time but I really we were struggling with that and and if you remember the really iPhone commercials they would show you the phone and they would talk you through an experience and they and they would do it right on the screen and the whole commercial was just executing what i don't it didn't matter right how to schedule an appointment how to find the nearest thing how to find and they would do it and you would go wow that is that is so much better than what i do today and it just continued to sell and sell and sell you haven't seen that with the iwatch because the social proof does not just doesn't it's not there yet so so um we really want to think about what are those benefits it's providing, and can I, can I, can I, because um, you know the shiny object and the uh, the new flashy thing, the cool thing, it's only going to last so long. It's not going to drive sustainable uh, business uh, or, or economic value for you. So let me share with you a couple of different examples of some things that we're working on, and unfortunately, so much of the experiences that I want to bring to you uh, are physical experiences that I can't really present on stage. So I'll tr try to do my best by sharing a video here. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay. Ford Direct is working uh, with our dealers and, and Ford Motor Company to bring customers a new experience. We're calling it Ford Match. Ford Match involves a number of different components, the first of which is to provide customers a self-serve option inside the dealership where customers can walk up and find information on demand. If they choose to, they can provide their Twitter handle. From that profile, we're then able to make recommendations about the vehicle that they may be interested in. We are then able to match that individual with the salesperson based on their personality profile. What I think is really cool is that when you typed mine in, it actually had the vehicle that I came here to look at. Hi, how are you? Hi. Destiny, nice to meet you. So what do you think? Like Did it. it match you with what you were looking for? When customers oh, come in, they don't immediately want to be helped, right? They want to go, you know, kind of look around, do their own thing. So I think this will work because it's like an electronic brochure. And so you don't have to immediately like grab a salesperson. You could just go to this and just kind of look at things before you approach a salesperson. I think Ford Match is pretty awesome. Because for somebody like me, I come to the dealerships, but I don't want to be bombarded by someone. These interactive displays are trying to personalize the information that they're presenting to the customer by taking into consideration uh, who is standing in front of the display and what interest they've expressed to us. So you already know what you wanted. You clicked on your inventory. You know that you want an F-150. I'm immediately alerted on my cell phone. I come to you. And from there, um, we just find out what vehicle you're ready to purchase. I think Ford Magic is going to be a great tool. Ford Match matches the customer, the vehicle, and me together. So it's, it makes the process really easy. It's really fun. 
Yeah, that, that, that's a good commercial. Uh, it was for a press release. But what, what, is, what we're doing there is we have these interactive displays that have a number of different sensors in them. So we've got cameras that will pick up the age and the gender of the individual who's standing in front of, in front of the display. Also uh, monitors their emotional response to the content that we're, pre that we're presenting. Uh, we've got Wi-Fi radios and blue chip, uh, Bluetooth uh, transponders built into the uh, display unit, so we're able to pick up anybody's device uh, that, that that is nearest to a display, and that they go over into another, oh, go interact with another display. We're able to carry that journey from one experience o over to the other, and then if you if you pick that up, what you're able to do is then if you, I I want to and I opt in, I can provide my Twitter handle, and what we do is we go and we pull all of you, all of the tweets. And we scrub them through the IBM Watson uh, system. They have a, a, a API called Personality Insights, which derives essentially a whole personality profile on that individual. Now, all the content that we're delivering to that customer is taking into consideration all of those things. So, um, um, and we also look at those uh, tweets around any sort of expressed interest uh, around our products. And then I make a product recommendation. And then when the customer is ready to actually interface with the salesperson, we're then matching that salesperson up with you based on your personality and their personality. So think of match.com happening right at the point of sale, right at the point of interaction, right? And doing all of that in real time. Now, one of the other things that we do is if, if we make recommendations to the customer about a product uh, based on everything we've been able to derive uh, from all of those sensors, and they, and they um, don't like the recommendation and they go and choose some other product to, to look at, the, the, the system is picking up all of that feedback and so the machine learning kicks in, our algorithms get updated, and now my, my recommendation engine is getting smarter and smarter. Um, and so now I don't think this lives in this form. Honestly, we launched this, uh, I've got some um, data. We, we launched this in four dealerships. We've got uh, displays out throughout the showroom. We've got displays in the service waiting area. Um, and we saw really low engagement. So this is actually fil filtering out all the noise and just customers. So 91,000 customers in the four dealerships over about six weeks. Only 3% of them were engaging. Um, and then this, you know, looking at highly engaged, the requesting help, how many of those were personality matched handoffs, what their satisfaction. The satisfaction was really great on the customer side. The sales was really good. We're finding. Um, a lot in the matching side, but the displays really aren't something of use. And the reason is because customers are, have already done all their research online. They've already found the vehicle they want. They're not shopping in the, in the, in the dealership anymore, right? So, so, but what we did find is we found great uh, traction in the service waiting area. So of the people who are coming in, dropping their vehicle off, and they have to wait for the repairs to get done, we're providing them an opportunity to find their next car, maybe get them into a new car today with lower payments, those types of things. And we're seeing 23% of all people who are sitting in the waiting area are going up and interacting. So that's, and those are, con those are producing about 40% of those are producing new car sales. And those are existing customers, existing loyalists. So it's not too hard to convert, convert them, but it is converting. And so what we're doing now is we're pivoting. And this is an important part around the whole innovation process is you really can't go in and go, okay, here's the idea, did it work, did it not work, done, I'm, I gotta move on, that thing didn't work. You know, how do I pivot? And so we're pivoting by looking at putting these display units in the service waiting area, putting an outside display, because we get a lot of people who don't wanna come to the dealership but wanna go look at vehicles, so they come after hours, uh, and, or they'll just stay outside and they'll never come in, and so we're putting displays out there to support customers. And then dealers are recognizing you got to go where customers are. So think about that, doing that online and physically. So customers aren't coming to your retail locations or coming into your you know, stores anymore. You, where are they going and how can I bring my experience to them? So you see, um, see this all over the airport, right? You now walk through the airport and there's all these vending machines and kiosks and self-serve stations and stuff. That's brands trying to reach you where you are instead of you trying to bring you in and so now we're trying to do that with the automotive experience dealers are putting their vehicles out at malls you may have seen this if you see a dealer a vehicle out at a mall it's usually because a, a dealer has worked a deal out with the mall and brought his, his vehicle out there and sometimes they'll stick uh, business cards in the windshield wipers or they'll or they'll do like a two-year free lease and if you fill out this form um, and uh, they're just like the worst leads ever but we're like let's bring an experience let's bring that retail experience let's help them shop Let's help them find the vehicle that's right for them and uh, do that on, on their terms. Uh, um, and uh, since we know they don't want to deal with the salesperson, 
We're not gonna provide, not gonna require that, but when we do hand you off, you're gonna, that handoff process, we wanna make sure that you're matched with the right person and that you get the best experience possible. And I think that whole matching process is something that will go away. You'll see it kind of bleed into how we process leads, the phone tree uh, system and where you get routed to will happen all automatically. Um, and, uh, um, but hopefully that'll drive a better experience. So. Um, Second one I wanted to uh, share, and this is one I really wish you got, all could experience, and, and you will here very, very, very soon. Actually, our first launch of this in a, in a live test is in Newport Beach, so not too far away. I mean, we're what, about six hours, five hours from Newport Beach. Um, but it's our, what we're, initial concept was this autonomous test drive. Our first experience is what we're calling our talking test drive experience. So in this experience, you can, go into a dealership, or in this case, it's gonna be what are referred to as the Lincoln Experience Centers, uh, one in New, uh, Newport Beach that I mentioned. And you'll be looking, learning about the brand, and now you wanna take one for a drive. So you provide some information, validate your driver's license, whatnot, put your name into, this, into the, into the um, kiosk. And then you're directed, given the keys by the personnel to go take your car for the drive, test drive. Now, when you walk out to the test drive, you'll notice this is gonna immediately be something different because we're now using these digital license plates that are connected. And so while they're in motion, they are a regular license plate, but while they're um, you know, uh, not moving, they can be anything you want and they're fully connected. So just think of your tablet on the back of the uh, vehicle, but it will tell you this is Mark's test drive. And so I know, oh, that's my test drive vehicle. I walk out to the car, I get in the car, and when I start the car up, the car is now going to educate you about itself um, through audio messages coming through, through the sound system and, and, and little helpful information that we put in the display unit. Obviously, while the car's in motion, there's only so much we can display there. But what we're really doing here is we're personifying the vehicle. So we're, we're now creating a, a voice of the vehicle. So I think about back to the Knight Rider days, everyone remember Kit, right? talk with Kit, and so I'm trying to bring Kit to life, right? And, and um, But when you go on this test drive, it provides you information about itself, but it does it contextually, and it does it in real time, so we're monitoring messages that are being fired on the CAN bus of the vehicle, and we're, we're, we're monitoring that in real time. Um, we're taking environmental conditions around the weather, where you're located, um, um, you know, using geofences and thing, things of that nature. And so the information that you get is not only you know, provided from this auto, uh, auto guy, but it's, 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 it's relevant and it's contextual, right? So now I've been driving on the freeway, I've been going more than 70 miles an hour, or well, 65 miles an hour, I drive fast, uh, for uh, you know, 30 seconds or 20 seconds. Let me start to talk about our adaptive cruise control, our lane assist features, autopilot and Tesla's terms, right? It's, let me introduce this to you and explain how, to, how you can use it. And then you can ask the car questions. So the car is listening, and so when you ask the, its questions, we're doing voice to text and then, you know, trying to answer those questions. If we can't answer those questions, you could always bring in, we can always bring in somebody to assist you while you're on that test drive right through the audio system. So you can ask the car, you know, say Henry, we're calling the car Henry, our initial car, um, off of the founder of Ford Motor Company, Henry Ford, and also the founder of uh, Lincoln. Uh, one of the two founders is Henry Leland. So we're using Henry. And say, Henry, I have a question, and try to ask the question. He says, well, I don't know, but let me, let me bring in a live person to assist you in that, uh, um, with that question. And so then we bring in through the sync system, you know, a live agent, and they say, oh, how's your test drive going? What can I help you with? And you're able to get those uh, questions answered. Now, um, this experience, so I just kind of talked through the rest of this. You get done with your test drive, and you get an email about, you know, kind of next steps and w what you might want to do, um, and if you have any other questions, how to, how to get those answered. Um, but, um, you know, now that uh, we built this out and we started to go on these drives, it was, we were super excited. First off, it just elevates the experience like you, won't, you wouldn't believe. But uh, it kind of sets an expectation of that vehicle and what that vehicle can do uh, for the consumer beyond what the car will do when you get it. So now the car, they're going to get the car and the car's not going to talk to them. They're not going to be able to talk with the car. And so um, we're looking to bring in that same capability to do onboarding and tutorial and helpful, you know, kind of, uh, some helpful services in vehicle, but um, 
this is a really cool, like I said, a really cool experience and, and uh, something we just completed our working prototype and are about to launch in, uh, later this year, early next year uh, at uh, Lincoln Experience Center and hopefully at all Ford and Lincoln dealers um, in, the, in, the, in the coming year here. Um, um, well, one, one of the things I want to mention is just our, our full concept is a fully autonomous via, a fully autonomous test drive. So you as a consumer can find a vehicle that you want to test drive through your shopping. Look for one that's available to you on a map. Uh, um, reserve it or check it out for a period of time to test drive it. Walk up to the car, use your phone, unlock it. Get in the car, start it without a key, and then take your test drive. Get the rest of that guided tour experience that I talk about and then return the vehicle at your convenience. Now, the cool thing about this uh, capability and why we chose this is one, this is looking at our existing core business and looking at how we can nurture that business and make that be business better, right? The traditional retail car purchase process as it exists today. We know the Ubers and all these on-demand services are emerging. We also know that the autonomous vehicle will be, a, uh, the self-driving vehicle will be a tipping point for those services because at that point, uh, ownership of a vehicle is going to become a real luxury. The cost of owning a vehicle will be 10x what it will cost you to, to transport yourself around uh, through these services, not to mention you'll get a diversity of experiences, diversity of products, what you need on demand. It'll be way better to have that than it will be to, to own. And so we know that's a tipping point. And this same capability is necessary in that future world of mobility services as it is today in, in, in the purchase process. And if you think about it, if, if, if I've got an on-demand um, uh, self-driving service for you and I want to introduce it to you I'm going to give you a free whatever free one day experience or free 25 mile drive and you're going to go on that in that experience and we're going to teach you about our service and we're going to educate you through the through the audio system and through the displays and so we're looking at these same capabilities and how they apply beyond just the initial application and so let me talk about our process a little bit and this is like this is really hard because you know I'm a creator, innovator, developer, like to, and putting structure around me is like really hard. But when I got this role of running innovation uh, for Ford and the dealers and trying to drive change in the, in the retail space, we found really quickly that, you know, it requires a little bit of discipline and how, and how to do this. And, and so uh, before I jump into some of the more lower level pieces, I think that this is a good, a really good simple view to think about as we go through this. But really, if I think about my business, your business, and I think about what it's impacting my business, so one of the things we do is we monitor all the different trends that are taking place in the world. And we look at those trends and identify which of those trends are most relevant to our business. So one, one trend that's going on in, in the world today is, uh, is people are eating bugs, okay? More and more, bug, 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 bugs provide a ton of protein and nutrients to, this is, this is actually true, this is a global trend, right? Now this has nothing to do with my business, so I can discard that one. Autonomous driving vehicles, automated vehicles, you know, these things are clearly core to, are, are happening in, in the world today, and they're really clearly aligned with my business. So I've gotta go through and I've gotta filter through those and say what ones are relevant to me, what ones aren't. And from that I'm gonna to start to develop what are called what we call opportunity spaces, and these are really where I'm going to place my strategic big, big bets and my areas of focus. And so we look at the automotive retail space, and we look at all of these relevant trends, and we start to say, where do these trends apply to our customer's journey, and how can I, um, where can I win? What assets do I have to leverage? What things can I pull together? And I define these opportunity spaces. Now, the fantastic thing about once I've now done that work. I now can bring the challenge to the rest of my company. So one of the things that we realized really early, we created this innovation lab. We were like, we want to bring, we want to get everybody innovating in the company. So how do we do that? Well, we started to run contests, right? Uh, first, first place wins. A, we did a Roomba and some other cool technology products, and we did it for our own employees, and they all got to submit ideas of new uh, innovation opportunities, new ideas, new opportunities that we could work on. And they all sucked, and they, uh, and they, uh, quite honestly, I mean, they were, they were flat. We were like, really, really? And we, and we got a, a bunch of them because people wanted free stuff, but it didn't really help. Now that we actually have worked and created these opportunity spaces, these clear areas of focus, so an example may be um, um, this notion of desk my own deal, right? That you yourself can buy and de develop your own deal, build it all on your own. Now I can go, okay, 
what can we do around creating new solutions or innovating our products that will help customers dust their own deal? Now they'll have tons of great relevant ideas and things have really started to kind of open up. So this is a really important mechanism. And then we start to look at our concepts and how we, and what, and what impacts those should, you know, could potentially have and we prioritize those. I'll talk about that a little bit, a little bit further. So this is our development funnel. So it's not the consumer funnel. I like to think of it as a rocket, rocket ship on its side or you know, propelling us to the future. But we have our innovation lab, which really um, looks at all these different ideas, runs ideation concepts, uh, takes those concepts, and we work through our five P's framework, which I'll talk about here in a second. And we really vet those and determine whether there's you know, winners or losers or whether this has traction or not. And then we have a function, which is our product development, which is really around operational change and how do these things get implemented within our organization? How does it get productized? How does it get brought to market? And then we manage our, exi our existing products and services. Now, we're a full digital company, so we're in this constant, constant mode of, of disrupting ourselves. And now that we've just re-gone through and developed our new opportunity spaces, which is an annual exercise for us, we're looking at what are the things that we're doing that we don't want to do anymore um, and, and what things do we want to invest more on. But I really think it's important just, I know it's kind of the stale end of the, of the, of the pipeline, but you know, thinking about your products do have a growth period and then, and then really more of a maintenance and a, and, a, and a close period that I think a lot of folks will, will forego. So here's our, our steps that we go through. Like I said, we annually evaluate all these trends, customer needs, um, different market examples, define our opportunity spaces. We then um, uh, create, uh, uh, we run ideation sessions and we create concepts around, um, or we get different ideas from our customers and, and uh, partners. Um, we actually, our lab is made up of not just folks within Ford Direct, but also our dealers are part of our lab as well, which somebody mentioned earlier how important it is to have your customers with you on that journey and co-creating the products. And us as a B2B business, our dealers are, 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 are our customers for, the, for that part of the value chain. Um, and then um, we then vet, uh, I don't know if this actually has, oops, I don't know if this has a laser, but... Um, we then vet all of our, our, our opportunities against six different lenses. So uh, whether it drives retail sales or service revenue, whether it's attracted to the market, so that is both to the consumer and for, for our dealers, whether it's financially attractive to us, whether it addresses the customer's pain point or an unmet need, whether it's differentiated or unique, and then our ease of implementation, whether we can be successful with this. Now, these are our lenses. You may have different lenses. Um, um, and I also, one of the things I also want you to think about when you think about how you measure uh, and rate your different opportunities, right now we're doing kind of an equal balance of these because we're kind of immature in our, in our, in our progress of doing this, but we recognize that these things will have different weightings at different points of time. So um, at different points of time, we may need to get more uniqueness and differentiation out in the market, and other times we really need to focus on sales or service. Um, so uh, there's nothing really other exciting other than to say we then have a product selection committee that is looking at all of our capital investments, not just those in innovation, but investments in our existing products and our own our own core operations and how to and, and those get all weighted and 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 uh, decisions are made accordingly, um, and then we track them through through a normal process and. Uh, um, we semi-annually reconcile uh, with our board. Um, but the cool thing is now when we run uh, concepts through our process, we end up having really meaningful conversations. So this is that autonomous test drive concept, which has gone through a tool that we use, which is called Lacuna, uh, I'm sorry, Lacuna Radar, um, and it really gives us the tool set to manage this. Um, but we're able to kind of output, here is the exact narrative and abstract. Here's some different inspirations, which are really market examples of things that other people are doing that are relevant. Down here, I can look at different market trends, the opportunity spaces. This one doesn't have it because at that time we didn't have any defined. And then I can look at this lens and see how did everyone rate it. Oh, we crowdsource our rating process. So our, we, we allow our leadership team today, but we're doing our rolling it out to our employees and all of our customers. So dealers in Ford will also be able to rate our concepts. And then we determine a course of action. So some of opportunities are enhancements to existing products, some are new products, some aren't well defined and need to be proved out, and they'll go into research and come into our lab to, to, to vet. 
Um, last thing I'm going to cover is just our five P's framework. So one of the things when we first started um, our innovation lab, we ran into a challenge because we were we would talk to people about oops, sorry about that. We would talk to people about um, what we were doing, and um, we kept hearing terms like prototype, proof of concept, pilot being thrown out interchangeably, meaning different things to different people at different times. And we were like, well, we need a really, and I'm sorry, I don't know what's going on. Maybe the battery's going on this. Um, but I want to talk about each of these because I think that this is a really good, simple way, applies to everybody, it's not specific to anybody's business, to think about taking stuff from idea to value capture, right? So it's a concept, sorry, it keeps wanting to go on me. I don't know if you can control it back there if I can turn this off. but. Um, it starts with us with a prototype. So what is a prototype? So when you create new things, um, one of the things we learned really early on is that if you present them in a PowerPoint, no one gets them. They don't really understand it. And we needed to, I'm sorry, um, we needed to come up with a new uh, method of doing that. And so we created this prototype concept. And so it's a minimally viable artifact that explains what the hell we're talking about. Um, and so this could be, uh, sorry. Did you cut me off? Yeah, no problem. Oh, it's a time. Oh, the, okay. Yeah, if you don't mind just running, running it for me and controlling it back there. So I'll start with one. Can you do you mind? So with one, so it's our prototype. So now this could be uh, a napkin drawing. It could be a storyboard. It could be an animated video. It could be a clay model, a 3D printed object. But it's something, it's an artifact that explains what, what the concept is and that people can get their head, head wrapped around. Um, this is very cheap, very fast. Sometimes we produce these in a matter of hours. Sometimes um, it's a day or two or a week at the most. Very cheap, very cost. The next stage is our prototype. So this is prove it, build it, actually make it work. You just explain that. So that whole autonomous test drive, that, that, that storyboard, that journey I just that was shown up there, that was our prototype artifact or a version of it. We did a few of them for that. Our prototype is actually now we have a, a, a test vehicle that you can go drive and it will talk to you and it will teach you and it will fire based on context. Our next stage, is, and this costs a little bit more, takes a little bit more time. At any point in time, we could get done with the prototype, say this is horseshit, we don't like this, move on. Or I might do the prototype, might prove it out, might say, you know what, now that I've actually built it, it doesn't really deliver on what I thought it was going to deliver on or it does, I couldn't really get it to work. The next stage is our proof of concept. So a proof of concept is where I take that prototype and I expose it to market conditions. So this might be in putting it in front of my consumers, testing it with my dealers. Um, but it's really a measurement stage. And this is where I get the learnings I need to to determine success or failure. And from that, I'm going to define what is going to become a product. Okay, My product is going to get developed as what I think the product is and what my go-to-market strategy should be. I then go to my next stage, which is a pilot, and I test that. And it's really the pilot stage is a limited release um, to a subset of your market to make sure that you have all of your things working the way they are supposed to be working, and it manages your risk down. And then your last stage is really that full-scale productization uh, uh, path. So um, each one of these stages takes longer, costs more, but they're really, it's a really good simple framework to kind of think about taking things from idea to, to value capture. So, and with that, I'm all done. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Phil. Hey. Oh, cool. Yes. Yeah, so if, if, uh, if you remember those six lenses, the well, does it drive sales or service revenue? Is it attractive in the market? Is it financially attractive to us? All of those things are quantified. So that's a really, it's an abstract view that you saw in this kind of spider web rating of what the opportunity was. But ultimately, we're trying to become more objective about that decision. And if it is going to drive value and it is unique or provides differentiation and we have a likelihood of success, and, 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 you know, those are rated the highest, and we should be moving forward with those. But what I will say is it's not quite that, that simple because just because something rates out and you've got a framework doesn't mean, you know, necessarily uh, is going to work or isn't going to work. Um, and often what I've found is in order to really drive change or create something new, it really does take 
a single individual who's really super passionate about it, who really believes in it and can see what others can't, and again, the 2.5% of the population, to really drive that thing forward. And so um, I don't know if that answers your question. We quantify based on all those six rating criteria, and we try to be objective about it. And, but again, it's not our, our product selection committee, our PSC, is made up of all the leads from our product, our innovation lab, our product development teams, our existing products and services team, our CEO, our CFO, and our head of marketing and, and sales. So they all are able to provide input, and but you know it at least gives us a guide by how things come out of our uh, out of the out of the process. Yes, sir. Oh, cool. Yeah. So while I understand the structured way of taking input from everybody, what is the role of intuition, instinct? Because there are things that nobody knows, like if you're driven too much by general wisdom, that's not going to necessarily lead you uh, anywhere. So how, how do you balance that? That is a really good question. Um, I'd say with a lot of passion, energy, and persistence, um, you know, this, this role of, of managing innovation, uh, one of the things that I've, I've, I've learned is it's, it's about, you know, 5% innovating and driving change, and it's really 95% around connecting with people, understanding how uh, this relates to them and their world, how this will improve their life, their, you know, their, the, the world that they live in. And, um, and so really understanding the operations, everyone's role, what they're doing, what this will mean to them, um, and thinking about that ahead of time when you're starting to prepare for um, talking through or presenting some of these ideas and trying to you know, gain advocacy for these, uh, that's really an art. I don't think it's a, a defined process. I mean, I, I think it really is a, a developed skill at least, you know, uh, but I'm still learning. I think uh, the professor said earlier, there's no, no experts. I'm definitely no expert. I'm just on this journey with you guys, trying to figure it out as we go. So, anything else? Yes, sir. Yeah. No. Well, you know, we're you know we're we're invest we're cost center mostly, so it's yeah. we're we're always squeezed. We're very limited in our resources resourcing on this, so uh, it's a constant challenge. So one of the things I would or there's a few things I would say to that. One, those opportunity spaces give us a, a clear line of a clear area of focus. So ideas come, and if they don't fit squarely in the bulls, I think of those as all bullseyes that we're trying to go. And if they don't fit there, then we shouldn't be working on them, and we've 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 got to dismiss them. That process of kind of rating those, crowdsourcing the rating, and, um, uh, and, and using the rating to be more objective, to at least prioritize, is another mechanism. The third is that providing the innovation function, the autonomy, it, and, and um, uh, capital investment, and human resource investment, to at least go through that prototyping and prototyping, maybe even into some market testing, without any sort of barriers of your traditional operation is also key, because that will really allow you to move faster and require less resources to get it done, and therefore you'll be able to get more done. So I think those three things all help, but um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a constant challenge. I mean, the test drive is a good example, because that one, now that we're looking to bring it to the next stage of a proof of concept, and Lincoln has five vehicles, Ford has like 17 vehicles in its lineup. Every single one of those vehicles requires unique development on its own just to even bring it to a proof of concept. So that particular one, most of our prototypes and POCs are you know, tens of thousands or hundred or $200,000 of testing. That one's like multiple millions of dollars just even to get through the learning process. But the promise of what that can be um, and 
create create differentiation and and value for uh, the you know the, the the value chain is enormous. So we think it's worth investing, but that requires additional investment and support outside of our core um, investment that we currently have in the in the resourcing that we currently have. So. Thank you. Thank you very much.